Ariel, let's start with your story. Ooh. Um, so I'm from South Florida. I have been in the uh, adult industry for 10 years now. I uh, started stripping in Fort Lauderdale, Florida while I was still in high school at 18. Uh, back then I presented mail. That was pre-transition. And then from that point, I learned about a different club, which existed in Hollywood, Florida. That was a trans strip club. So I began medically transitioning around like 19, 20 years old uh, with my best friend at the time. We stripped together. Uh, also, we both escorted. Um, then... You're saying a lot. Yeah, stuff. I know. And if so you want to much. stop me at any point, I, that's why I, I wanted to go a little bit story. before, like childhood. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I actually. Like what's your background? Was it sure. conservative? I or? am very fortunate in that both of my parents came from households that were just kind of like, you know, fuck it, do what you want. <laughs> and uh, so my mother is half Cuban and half white. My father is all Colombian. They were both born in Miami, Florida. Uh, they are both first generation. Um. Uh, uh, I was born in Camdenton, Missouri, Lake of the Ozarks, very rural. Uh, they relocated there because my grandma told them it would be nice. Mm -hmm. is that, that the is pizza, the pizza man? <laughs> That's <laughs> the next scene. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I didn't bring my lingerie. Here's so yeah. oh, someone God. else. But um, got some in my car tomorrow. <laughs> uh, yeah. So my parents are both very open-minded people um i texted my mom before i got here because i wasn't actually sure what the podcast was centered about i mm -hmm. thought maybe it was more mental health uh potentially uh i am a clinically bi diagnosed bipolar um i asked her like when did you know when did doctors agree and when did we start chemically you know figuring out how to circumvent that situation uh she said she knew when i was three that something was off. I was diagnosed uh, with depression, OCD, and ADD uh, very young, I think, because those are like very easy things to treat and get people hooked on pills for. And then um, I think it was like around middle school that they were like, oh, maybe bipolar would be a more comfortable umbrella to categorize this person with, because I'm sure as you know, bipolar disorder is very often used as an umbrella term for any sort of chemical imbalance. And as are many different quote unquote disorders. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so um, I had begun uh, taking different medications for that because I was a very unique child. Um, always very artistic, always very um, e emotional and expressed those emotions very, very vocally. And so everyone around me knew like, okay, this one is a little off. I never actually came out to either of my parents because it wasn't necessary. Um, at two years old, my grandma was like to my father, you know, that one's a, you know, a little light and it's loafers, you know, that's a, that's a fairy. And he was like, no, that's my son. And so when most fathers have to like, have this grieving process like my son is gay my son is a woman whatever uh they're older and the child is the one to tell the father my father already knew so he had that grieving process when i was in like elementary school so i never even had to deal with that my parents have always accepted me they've always known that i was unique and that was just going to be who I was and they accepted that at a very early age and that's why I was able to start stripping in high school because when I turned 18 I told my mom you know because I was dating the DJ at the time at the strip club when I was 17 and he was 42 and uh, she knew that I was dating him and I told her when I'm 18 you know I'm going to start working there she's like no and I can't stop you but I just I worry for you because I'm also third generation my mother and my grandmother both worked in strip clubs so they were all very cognizant of what happens in strip clubs. And so it wasn't necessarily that I was going to do it that worried her. It's what I could be getting into that worried her. And mm -hmm. um, luckily she trusted me because she knew from a young age I was going to do whatever the fuck I wanted to do and I knew it was going to be best for me. And, and it did work out 
for the best in the end. I'm not a drug person. No regrets. Never, no, none. Um, I think everything is a learning experience. You know, even if something doesn't work out how you want it to, you can still take something from it and use it as a constructive experience, regardless as to the trauma it could have caused. Mm-hmm. You know, that's very positive. I try to be. <laughs> so you started stripping when you were in a teenager. Yeah. As a lot of people in South Florida do. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a very over-sexualized community. And um, that's kind of just the uh, the atmosphere. The culture revolves around sex. And I think that's super toxic. It's unfortunate, but it is what it is. My middle school, there were tons of girls, like 13 years old, just got their period and now they're pregnant. You know, that's just kind of how... Coral Springs, Fort what Lauderdale, do you think, where I'm from. What do you like, think contributes to that? I think there's a lot of variables. I've always described South Florida as um, there is this atmosphere of perpetual vacation. So I find that a lot of people who live there are kind of on autopilot and they don't really, they're not as socially aware. They kind of, for lack of better terminology, they're just mentally delayed. I find in a lot of ways. So I didn't know a lot of stuff about me until I left South Florida. I had started chemically transitioning at 20 years old and stopped because I ended up um, back in the day, you used to be able to buy your hormones online. Mm -hmm. So me and my best friend were buying a shit ton of different kinds of estrogen, taking all of it all at once. Yeah. And I developed a cyst on my thyroid the size of a golf ball literally overnight. Mm -hmm. So that kind of set me in a tailspin where I was like, what the fuck am I doing? Who am I? All this stuff. And um, why was that ever legal? No one knows. Well, you know, they hadn't made it illegal yet. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes time to, Mm -hmm. you know, figure out shit like that. But what made you want to take those chemicals? I knew I was, uh, for lack of a better term, a woman. I knew that I pres- I am more female than anything else. But the thing about where I am from was there wasn't a lot of encouraging um, energy around like just breaking uh, social norms. I, In my opinion, uh, the clubs that I grew up in we were all there to kind of please dudes. You know, if you were a feminine little gay boy, you're supposed to be trying to impress the big manly gay men. If you're uh, presenting female, you're supposed to be sexually attractive and enticing to men. And that was just kind of like what you did. And it, it never spoke to me because I've always been more attracted to a balance of masculine and feminine energies. So I've always been, uh, you know, interested in, Feminine men and trans women and trans men, cis, like macho cis dudes never really spoke to me. It just, you know, wasn't something I could really relate to with um, my friend group. And when I moved here was when I started chemically transitioning again, because I realized there is this thing called non-binary. Gender exists on a spectrum. It isn't A or B, Mm -hmm. uh, just based on science. And uh, I don't like talking about science because I'm not a fucking scientist. But traditionally, throughout thousands of years, there have been many cultures who agree uh, gender exists on a spectrum. And I personally identify as trans femme, which just means I have transitioned and I identify as more female than anything else. But I also transitioned for me. A lot of trans women transition with the thought of passing being on the forefront of their mind. And a lot of times that's because uh, they want to protect themselves. It's a safety thing. If you can pass in public, that means you're less likely to be assaulted or have Mm -hmm. some sort of hate crime occur. Um, So I get that. Passing is super duper important to a lot of people. For me personally, when I look in the mirror, I love what I see and I actually recognize the person that's looking back at me now whereas years ago I remember being in elementary school and looking in the mirror and being like it's so weird like that's the brain that's in my head is in that person's body it wasn't like a male female thing I just did not recognize that person they did not look familiar to me it was truly like I've met you but you're not me now I can look in the mirror and I'm like of course that's what I always saw in my head, but when I would look at a picture, it wasn't what was there. 
So it's totally surpassed gender identity for me. It truly is just existing. This is what I am and what I look like in my mind. Um, so my goal really isn't necessarily to pass because I want people to believe that I am a cisgendered woman. I don't care what people see. I do, however, want to be more passing to some degree for that safety reason. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get a fucking brick thrown at my head because someone can tell that I'm trans. I don't care what they see. I don't care what they perceive me as. I do just, you know, try and mind my business. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be super sticking out for my trans identity. I do really appreciate what you're saying because I was I was thinking before we came on here that um I have a I've had a number of clients for instance who, you know, for whatever reasons don't necessarily feel like they're able to engage in with the people in the world that they encounter in a way that would be quote unquote passing. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes this whole trajectory of of transitioning doesn't even look the way that it people think of it in this very singular way where you have to sort of like co-sign some sort of, uh, you know, binary representation. Yeah. Um, you know, some people might experience themselves in ways that are, you know, inconsistent with the gender they were assigned mm -hmm. and at the same time um, not want to like physically transition in. Yeah. All the same, you know what I mean, I imagine. Yeah, it is tough. Gender is something that is super personal and I think it's important that we as a world just collectively take a beat shut the fuck up let the person say what they think they need to say because we're all imperfect we are all flawed things that i say now and believe now i didn't believe five years ago we grow we're constantly evolving and um if we just instead of ask questions in order to have a response and ask those questions so we can hear what the person is saying and see what their point of view is and see why they feel that way, maybe we'll have a lot more understanding. And, um, you know, I've, I've gotten some flack for identifying as non-binary uh, and also referring to myself with, like, female pronouns mm -hmm. because they're like, oh, non-binary people aren't trans. You're not trans. I didn't spend the fucking money, time, and energy to look this way to not be considered a part of the trans community. I don't give right. a fuck either way who wants me or who doesn't because ultimately I have transitioned because this was what needed to happen for me. But there is way too much pressure to pass in our community. And I think you're privileged if you get to that level. Uh, the fact of the matter is there are so many people out there who are trans mm -hmm. who happen to be you know, super fucking tall with huge shoulders and, you know, very strong jaw lines and big feet and like all these different things that are so typically considered to be masculine. And they don't get that luxury of just being able to blend in and be a five foot four, 130 pound, you know, passable woman. They aren't going to get to have that experience and to discredit their transness because they're not as pretty as you makes you a shitty person. And it, I think it kind of conceals the fact that what's really being attacked is I think femininity, right? It's not, mm. it's not just how someone identifies. It is femininity Truly. itself. It's like absolutely a, a good friend of mine was telling me once um, a, a trans uh, friend of mine was saying that, you know, she said, when you, when you and I walk down the street at night, she's like, I'm, I'm concerned for both of us, but for different reasons. Mm. And I thought it was so interesting because what she pointed out was she was like, uh, a man might attack you because he wants to occupy your body, sure. you know, but for me, he wants to destroy mine. Um, and it, it really, you know, really like um, punctuated the point to me yeah. that femininity is what is being attacked and that that is kind of a, a necessary um, a necessary next step or part, I think, of the process of maintaining this like relative upper hand, you know, for <laughs> for masculinity, which is, you know, yeah. the agenda, right? Um, and so. I, I'm so guilty of this myself. Sometimes I slip into just saying trans and then I automatically mean uh, trans females, but trans masculine people yes. too also. Um, there's so much societal pressure for them to be perceived a certain way. And I feel like a lot of it comes back down to the uh, kind of the upper escalon, echelon of, of people who run the show are cis heterosexual 
males. So a lot of the discussion is always seen through uh, an assigned male at birth person's perspective. Mm -hmm. And I catch myself doing it so often that I just, I completely forget, oh my God, I'm not, I'm being more inclusive of trans mass people. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have their own fucking hills to, to climb because there is so much pressure on them also to look a certain way, pass in a certain regard. And uh, yeah. You mentioned the masculine and the female and you mentioned femininity from the community I was raised in's perspective. Mm -hmm. Gender is biological. Sure. And that's it. Mm -hmm. So how do you explain it? Is it performative? Is it historical? So it depends on where your question's coming from. Um, if we want to talk... Maybe you can flesh out like, sure. those things to just give a grounding of... I mean, I think it depends, you know, what ideological perspective you're coming from. But, you know, from my point of view, gender is a social construction, which is to say that it's not just that these concepts of masculinity, male and female, are, are constructions, but the entire gender binary itself is a construction. It's a construction of thought. It's something that um, is is used as a like a technology of power to to you know discipline culture basically into behaving in certain ways and and for people to be organized um, according. But to organization's good for a society, for a civil society, and being able to have a distinct part of the construction, the scaffolding or whatever part of the analogy that you can point to and say, okay, this is this type of person and this is this type of person. Is it? I don't well, know that it is. Why? So I, I, I'm with you on that, but I think there's another layer to it also. So throughout history, um, I mean, if you want to talk about biology, um, yes, typically that's why we describe it as a spectrum as opposed to one or the other. Intersex people are born every single day. So a person can have XY chromosomes and then have genitals that do not actually fit into this very binary concept that doctors and society wants us to believe are the everything. The people are born every single day with genitals that because if you want to talk biology, I think we're probably mm -hmm. getting down to either your chromosomes or what's between your legs. In the womb, we all start off female. But it would we all start off the same. And then things happen. And so there are people who do not look from the waist down like one or the other. So biology would say that, you know, if you want to get into a um a metaphysical or a theological standpoint, did God make a mistake? Did this person that uh can't reproduce um, because their genitals don't do this or do do this, um, are, what are they according to you? Their chromosomes say that they're this, but they have a vagina. Their chromosomes are neither of those things. They're X, X, Y. And then their genitals look like that. There's so many different variants. Uh, I don't think that it's fair to say, well, they're still this, even though their genitals look like this. The problem is, is that doctors for years and years uh, told parents that your baby was born with um, genitals that are not the norm. Mm -hmm. And so they are mutilated at birth uh, in order to make their genitals look like some form of a penis or a vagina. And then they have to go through multiple painful terrible surgeries that are scarring emotionally and physically for the rest of their lives because they're told that, well, there's no real science saying that it would be bad to just leave it alone, but their mental health, they're going to be different than other people. Mm -hmm. Do you really want your child to be different? And you ask any of these intersex people who, uh, you know, had to go through these surgeries, I don't think you can find one who says, oh, I'm so glad that they just chopped me up downstairs and, you know, made my life so much harder because I, my parents wanted me to fit into a binary and the parents don't know better. Now there's a lot more um, discussion about what to do in the case of a baby being born who is intersex. But 
That's biology. Um, and it just as a, as a note, um, mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken, you might know about, more about this than I do, but um, historically, at least, the the way that it was determined as to how somebody would be designated as, as male or female at birth was largely um, determined according to whether or not that 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 person's um, let's say presumably male genitalia was large enough, right? Exactly. And Do you so, have testicles? Is right. the clitoris large enough? Is there kind of just nothing? Is there just like a hole? Right. Like there's, they always tried to assign whatever the genitals, genitals looked closest to, mm -hmm. but then so often the person would grow up and then just feel like, why do I feel different? Why does my stuff look different? And they wouldn't know because the parents wouldn't know how to have that conversation that we, we did some surgery when you were right. born. And even then it's like, you know, we're, we're weighing this against, do you meet the standards of masculinity? Are you large enough to be a man? Which, which yeah. means that we're still defining people, you know, uh, according to whatever is most masculine or whatever is the other or is not mm -hmm. right and so there's still this idea of like the the sort of you know male subject being the defining principle of everything else yeah we <laughs> um, all our lives are shaped around uh, masculinity yeah, yeah. and then you just kind of have to make it work and i actually had a very interesting discussion discussion with norman our mutual friend the director and um it was largely based around how throughout history you know the masculine archetype is the provider and the feminine archetype is the child care giver. Mm -hmm. And a lot of society is based around those very, you know, historical archetypes. And um, because the masculine archetype just typically is physically more strong, um, women or the female archetype had to find power not through brute strength, but through sexuality. And so often we have um, this struggle with masculine and femininity and the feminine has to be hypersexual in order to gain that power. And uh, it's, it's a sticky situation. It's, I think, very complicated and layered. But you had said something earlier, and I just want to speak towards it because I think it is a really important concept that was brought up mm -hmm. to me by my trans female friends who live very differently than I do. Their goal is to pass. They typically do not reveal their gender identity to people. They are female and that's it. And um, we were talking about pronouns and I like to go by they, them. And uh, when someone asks for someone's pronouns, in my mind, I think it's kind of respectful. For them, they were like, I'm a woman. You're going to look at me mm -hmm. and my breasts and my long hair and the beauty and energy that I am putting forth and you are going to question my gender? So they find it to be very disrespectful because a lot of the time, and I will give them this, it's kind of like this very tongue in cheek, like, what are your pronouns? I can see that you are trans. I recognize you are trans. And now I am invalidating your femininity by questioning whether or not you're cis or not. Right, right. So I get that. That definitely, you know, that hits, that hurts. You can never be sensitive enough. Well, I'm also kind of troubled by this idea that, I don't know if anyone else has noticed this, but there have been times when I've been on Zoom calls over COVID and whatever, and there's like this requirement that everybody has to sort of, I like to think of it as like confessing um, your pronouns. Uh. And the thing that to me is troubling about it is I get the effort. Um, I'm not trying to say it's all just virtue signaling, mm -hmm. but at the same time, I imagine that we're concealing the way that power is actually at work when we require people who in a normative sense are presumed to be, you know, whatever gender, like most people would, would, would you know what I mean? And so it's kind of like, it gives the illusion that we are all actually operating in this equitable space when we're not. Mm -hmm. And, and so there, it's very tricky. Um, it is I tricky. Think. And I don't think we're ever going to get it totally right, but that's just where I feel. Let's all just take a chill pill. <laughs> let's calm down. Let's, Try and just not be offended by every little misspeak that someone has because at the end of the day, we are flawed and we're going to say things that rub people the wrong way or our 
intention isn't going to come across the way that we meant it. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, if you disagree with someone, you're allowed to. But get your point across without invalidating someone's experience. Be curious, but, not judgmental, basically. Yeah. yeah. This is driving me nuts, so I got to blow this out. <laughs> okay. Disorder, though, runs um, in South Florida, it sounds like, which is kind of humorous. But you bring up disorder, and that brings out an elephant in the room for me, mm -hmm. which is that these are these are being trans typically finds its way um to a person that has experienced either tremendous trauma or has some kind of disorder um so i do believe you are correct in that a lot of trans people have experienced trauma i just wouldn't i just get nervous when people make that parallel almost as if it's a reason like causal right the that's trauma where I'm finds that's where us I'm unfortunately from. which is really just so hard because i'm very fortunate i am very cognizant of how lucky i am in a lot of different ways i had a really nice childhood i didn't have childhood trauma i had you know the way I remember my childhood is not exactly the way that my older siblings do. They remember it being a lot harder than it actually, in my opinion, was. Um, my father struggled with drug addiction. My mother is also bipolar. My grandmother um, had clinical depression. That doesn't sound uh, idyllic at all for a child. Well, no, but it was still my childhood, and I don't look at it negatively. I think we all have... Everyone's childhood is traumatic. Down. Yeah, extent. I think everyone experiences <laughs> shitty things when you're a kid. Of course, mm -hmm. if you didn't, then poor you. You probably are very bland. And <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you had nothing to make you um, stronger. I hate the idea that like... You know, what so trauma is a little salt in the soup. It's a little seasoning. You know, I much pressure to like make your child's life just the best. You want to break um, uh, ancestral fucking... Uh, you know, cycles and be better than your parents were to your child. But in in my opinion, I mean, I am very fortunate and I'm grateful for this, but I'm one of the few people I know of in the sex industry who didn't have any sexual trauma in my childhood. Um, I was born with a chemical imbalance. I wish I could blame that <laughs> for her being trans, but they totally don't coincide. No. There's, there's no crossover there. My, both my grandmother and my mother both are chemically imbalanced. I'm the only person in my entire family extended included who is trans. And there's tons of chemical imbalance all throughout my family. Also that, that I just want to say one thing that, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of people who have been diagnosed, you know, with bipolar disorder and, it, it's something that can be very well managed for a lot of people, you know, once they find, um, you know, the right sort of uh, balance of medication. So I, mm -hmm. I just wanted to kind of like state that, that it doesn't, I think there's this impression sometimes that if someone's bipolar, that that means that there's, um, I don't know, that, that they can't, they, crazy. yeah, that they can't lead I, normal I, lives and that's just not wall. true. So I haven't been, um, I took the cognitive behavioral therapy route as opposed to pharmaceuticals. I had been prescribed some form or fashion of antipsychotic or antidepressant from a very young age because that's what my mom did. Um, when I got old enough to like start making decisions for myself, I was like, you know what? I want to try and do things my way. And truly just taking yourself out of a situation saying, okay, how would a third party react to this dynamic and what would they say and what would they do? What do I, what am I inclined to do? And is that over the top? Is that um, under, you know, playing the issue? And just having that perspective has been very instrumental to my mental health and being able to navigate this industry, which is all about comparison. Mm -hmm. A lot of the time, uh, there is enough room for everybody. This town is big enough for both of us. And uh, it's very easy to forget that at times and compare yourself to other people um, in the adult film industry. And 
you see it all the time on Twitter. People need to take mental health breaks. They need to say, okay, I'm taking a step back and I'm not going to be on Twitter for a couple months. I need to focus on myself. And I always, I'm every day I scan Twitter to make sure like, is anyone taking a mental health break today? Like, give them a little <laughs> word of encouragement because it makes such a, for me, it makes such a big difference to know that I'm being supported when I need to take a little, a little reprieve. But, um, I saw a tweet that was amazing. It was, um, my pronouns are who? What? <laughs> Why? <laughs> uh, like, like super like viral and yeah, amazing. It's I love it. But um, even diagnoses though, right, are are are, are c- constructed within a particular cultural space. I mean, like oh, absolutely. You know, like mm-hmm. uh, borderline personality disorder, for instance, is something that is like historically very much you know designated toward many like traditionally um, you know quote unquote female attributes. And qualities. Do you know what I mean? Like that. Oh, I never thought about that. You know, if that. you think about it, like this idea of being, um, you know, uh, uh, you're too much. You are overly, dr- overly dramatic. Mm-hmm. Um, you're histrionic. You um, are too, too attached, too needy. All of these things that are associated with femininity are designated as this disorder. Well, you know, I'm not that surprised. Like, I know it wasn't a bunch of women who are who wrote the DSM, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course. They I, need a but, you know, yeah. all of these things are, are political in nature, um, so, and they continue, you know, to, so to function that way, so. But there's definitely certain female attributes that get played up maybe even to a fault, maybe, like, community building and community mindfulness that goes to more the female when it could also be yeah. a male attribute. And we then call it communism. <laughs> 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 we call it but yeah, I uh, I wish I could blame my transness on something other than the fact that I just am trans. Uh-huh. Um, the uh, fact that I am very fortunate and I've been able to get my bipolar disorder under control with just cognitive behavioral therapy mm-hmm. um, is kind of a unique experience, I think, to me. And I can't speak for other people. I can only speak for myself. And I ultimately, it is a fucking bitch, you know, being bipolar. (laughs) But I really feel that it has helped me so much as a performer because I'm able to look at these things that I see people struggle with every day in my industry. And I have the tools to circumvent them. I had to figure out how shit was going to work for me much younger than I think I would have ideally had it because my circumstance was just unique to me Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. i can only speak towards myself and how did you overcome bipolar disorder with cognitive i I won't say that i overcame it but (laughs) i um i have tools that uh make it much more easy to manage uh because of my unique circumstance i had really a strong support system Mm -hmm. in my youth. My mother and my father were always loving and accepting of me. And I'm very fortunate in that. And when I needed space, they gave it to me. When I needed a hug, I got one. There must've been those, some confusion or concern that. Oh, we were all very fucking confused. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To this day, my father is very sensitive and I will just say something and he'd be like, being serious or are you being sarcastic again i can never tell with you mm-hmm. and i'm like dad oh my god i was being funny stop being so sensitive mm-hmm. but um it, it it's just that uh i always had someone in my corner and i feel that with that positive reinforcement i was really able to develop these tools sooner than a lot of other people um, were even aware they existed. Mm-hmm. Is that to say that like community for you has really been the the biggest asset in terms of your ability to uh, manage in a world that isn't always very accepting and that can be really trying? Yeah. Uh, for sure. Even though I have always been, you know, I, w- I won't go as far to say like a black sheep, mm-hmm. but I have always been very much like that one isn't normal. Like, it's visible. The psychedelic sheep of <laughs> the Joseph's rainbow technicolor coat of sheep um, was my vibe. But, yeah, uh, people have always just known that I'm fucking Joseph's weird. Joseph's so, technicolor. <laughs> dream coat. Dream I can't remember coat. the fucking play. But, yeah, um, it was just very obvious. And uh, my uniqueness, I felt, always had certain people drawn to me and 
I've been fortunate that I've always just had that support system from unique places. I wouldn't have passed graduated high school if Mm. it was not for the fact that my teachers could tell that I was just different. And um, they let me pass. There's no, I I failed like Mm -hmm. almost every single, from seventh grade onward, I should have failed. You're not only only different, you're talented. You got them to pass you even though you didn't deserve it. (laughs) I went shopping with my uh, art teacher in high school. We went to Wilton Manors, which is kind of like our West Hollywood in Fort Lauderdale. Mm -hmm. And we would go to this um, antique store and like buy vintage clothes and jewelry together. And I was stripping at the time and she knew I was stripping. And she said, listen, I know that you need extra sleep. I know you're out really late. And I know you have a bunch of extra money. I really (laughs) like this brooch. I will pass you if you promise. There was no bartering. There was no bartering. I did not sleep with any of my teachers, and I did not barter brooches for passing grades. I was just nice. I was nice. I got along with them. Mm -hmm. My um, art teacher was just like, I know you're going to be out late, so uh, we're going to mark you for my first, second, and third period you come in for fourth and let me know when you're here and I will just like mark wow. you four periods of art. That's a well, great my, school. my senior year I had, and it was also the second half of my senior year, mm. the way that we did high school at this particular, so it was a magnet school. So like they just did things a little bit differently, but the first uh, half of the year you had a certain set of classes and the second half of the year you had a different set of classes. I had, um, passed all my core classes. So I got to have an extra elective my last six months of Fun. high school. Yeah. So I got, three electives and we moved them all to the first half of the day and they were all art and uh mrs black was just like just let me know when you hear shout out mrs black did yes did you have any um high school or school projects that you're very proud of from as you when you were a kid i ran for prom queen when i was in my senior year and i won no oh, kidding. Yeah, I was my senior prom queen. That was fun. Still presenting as male. But and- passing on well, another level. That's really interesting. Well, that you, actually, you were, you were, you were still presenting as male. and, and with- I went in drag that whole week, and um, people didn't even really know who I was prior, but then... It sounds so fucking cheesy, but I mean, I walked school, that's past impressive. like uh, the football players and they were like, oh, damn, she thick. And then like someone who knew was like, that's a boy. And they like <laughs> freaked the fuck out. So past that point, I got a lot of respect, but I also from those people where I challenged their sexuality, I think it caused a lot of hyper aggression in them. The and whole, so like, there trickery was trickery kind of idea. Yes. This yeah. I, this concept of tricking someone yeah. into finding you attractive is very toxic, but um, it, it, it gave me a touch of clout, a little bit more I hope respect. It, I, I hope think. it helped you to, um, to feel, uh, much more acknowledged, you know, for well, it's very empowering because, you know, yeah. um, the first, apparently the first woman who ever existed, you know, Eve, she also was a trickster. So <laughs> yeah, tricky there bitch. you go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't like the idea of finding validity and, um, uh, I, the word escapes me, but basing your self-worth on whether or not you're attractive to men. I think that's just inherently fucking toxic. You are who you are and you're stunning because you are a human, not because men find you sexually attractive. But it was, it felt good. I'm not going to lie and Mm. say it didn't. You know, I liked being attractive, but that's definitely not why I transitioned. And that was a big part of me taking a break from HRT. I wanted to figure out why am I doing this? Am I doing this because I want other people to see me a certain way? Or is this how I see myself? And that is a huge issue I found in my community um, from where I'm from, where a lot of people, their motivation became very external. As opposed to finding validity in themselves, they their validation came from external sources. Were people finding them attractive? Were people thinking like they are cis? Were, um, Isn't that, though, what's ultimately gratifying about doing porn? It's that you're going to be found attractive by other people, and I love to be found attractive. So I think there's stock in what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But um, for me, I do sex work because of um, the fact that I enjoy it. I have a much easier time, honestly, working with customers as an escort than I do uh, performing on set because 
my experience, uh, as long as I am having that positive reinforcement, I'm able to perform better. If I don't feel like everyone's on board and I'm providing like something really solid, I have a hard time performing. So when I'm escorting, I'm really able to know like you're here because you're enjoying yourself. And that gets me off when I'm on set. So I like that. Like the positive reinforcement need is toxic. I think everyone can get behind that. Um, where that's something that drives maybe I not the best say, behavior. I, to a degree. I, what I'm saying is that I like that and I don't think that's bad in certain circles, in certain scenarios. Mm -hmm. If that's your driving force and you can't uh, provide, you know, in any venue, in any circle of life, if you can't do anything unless you're getting positive reinforcement, then you need to be looking inward because it's very dangerous. I also want to point out like context matters, right? Because like... In, I mean, at least when, as it's been explained to me, um, when you're on set, you know, like shooting, um, like filming and stuff, you have quite a bit of control and agency over what happens, right? Oh, yeah, And for so sure. there's a way in which, like, Sometimes I imagine... Sometimes more than others, but... Okay. <laughs> you can yell cut even if you're not the director. Absolutely, yeah. You can stop something from happening if you're really not okay with it, but um, there's a huge shift in the industry as well though you're absolutely right you know, we pleasures. do have a lot more agency yeah. than we used to yeah and so i mean it's very different than like i imagine if you're like out in the real world and even like doing um like being an escort i assume if you have like uh, a client who's like a regular that you know very well versus some random i don't know exactly how you know you've done that in the past but like it, i i just i i think it kind of can be a little bit of a uh dangerous situation to sort of just equate all of these things you know what i mean as if it's right. some blanket experience because right. i sex work is i mean it runs the gamut you know it truly does and it is nuanced and very unique to each individual's experience and that's why i try and always say like this is me i can't speak for everyone so is it was, feel, was it just an but... extension of the stripping eventually um so first day i started stripping was the first day i started escorting it all kind of happened at once that's just a seems club that so I grew dark up in. it seems so dangerous it, does, it seems so I foolish like I, so... Well, you wouldn't want your kid to be doing this down the line or maybe you don't care i don't know i it... i find for me this is what i was supposed to be doing i feel truly that i'm able to provide a service that i know a lot of people cannot provide because i truly am making sure that when my client leaves my home they know that they're not just a client that they are a, a friend in some regards now we have to respect those boundaries but this is why i'm able to do what i do because i'm not jaded by what i do i'm not bitter and i'm not um complacent i'm able to compartmentalize certain dynamics with certain people in my life and recognize them as just that a couple of my regulars that I see every single month know that they are my friend. I am their confidant. We can hang. We can have a good time. But the boundaries of our relationship will always be, I need to be compensated. And I'm going to treat you with respect, but don't cross my boundaries because then I can't continue the relationship with you. I will treat you like a person if you treat me like a person. And that's just our understanding. And I mean, to be honest, um, are you, do you find yourself also functioning as a therapist? As much as a lot of times, yeah, yeah. yeah no, absolutely. Yeah. A lot, of, especially back in the day, uh, since I really put a lot of uh, time and energy into uh, adult film, I haven't had time to escort quite as much because mm -hmm. every single thing that I do, I do because I want to and because I like it. If I do anything too much, which is why my family always thought I was going to be an artist. I was very pushed to go into college for art. There was like some institute in Atlanta, I think, that I was supposed to end up going to. But, um, oh, I forget why I even brought that up. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Oh, therapist. So um, I've uh, always just kind Yeah, she just equated her whole profession to what you do. So yeah, we're, we're well, starting Well, I'm, I'm okay with that. We, uh, we help people process shit, you know? Mm -hmm. Um I did lose my train of thought, though. I don't remember. Well, what I, I was the reason I brought that. that up was because, like, you know, I, I, I have a lot of clients who, who do various kinds of sex work, and that it's a constant sort of theme that I encounter. Um, that a lot of the clients that they have look to them for as a source of support, as someone they can speak with openly about their mm -hmm. lives, and and sometimes that is the only space where they really feel like they can 
speak with somebody honestly and not be judged. Totally. And if there's a spectrum of things you could be doing in this world when you're playing therapist, that's probably a beautiful experience and really intimate and nice. But on the spectrum. Very intimate. Because you're naked half the time. Oh, that's all I was but saying. On the sp- a lot of my clients, um, especially a couple years ago when I was able to focus more on escorting as opposed to porn, were, um, a lot of it was non-sexual. Yeah. We yeah. just hung. We just hung out and talked and chit-chatted. And sometimes we were naked and sometimes we weren't. Maybe mm-hmm. there would be like a little something happen like in between. But it was mostly just hanging out and they were able to decompress with me and be honest and just explore things that they aren't comfortable talking about with their wife. They aren't tra- comfortable talking about with their buddies. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, I always found it interesting that it's legal to pay for certain things. If it's filming, if it's being filmed, Ugh. but if there's no camera rolling, then Don't LAPD started. I mean, <laughs> but the overreach, you know, uh. <laughs> But if there's a spectrum though, mm-hmm. there's some spectrum of spirituality that maybe you'll acknowledge that when you're intimate with someone, there's you're breaking a piece of yourself and you're putting it in their jar you and are. vice versa. So um you know, and I you're kind of speaking towards something that I'm a little bit on the passionate side about. Some people like to use this um uh uh metaphor of like you're selling your body. You are giving away a part of your soul each time you have sex with someone. And in my mind, in my realm, I'm not selling me. I'm selling an experience, but I am not compromising myself in order to have these intimate encounters with people. Um, Anyone can interpret anything how they want, and that's their prerogative. But... For me, I'm able to compartmentalize and disassociate to a certain degree where I do not feel used, I do not feel um, objectified in the dynamics that I choose to put myself in. If I find that a customer is being disrespectful or not uh, being cognizant of the experience I'm giving them and why it's unique, I just won't see them anymore. I'm not going to put myself out for money in any regard. Um, If there's a director who I find just isn't respecting me as a human, I won't work with them anymore. I don't need the money more than I need my own self-respect. Is there a lot of money in what you do? What, uh, porn? Yeah, in your... Escorting, yes. Porn, it's great advertising. More people know who I am and have this concept of me now than they ever would have had I not been in adult film so i'm able to make my rates higher i'm able to be more picky i'm able to really be very judicious with the way i spend my time do either of you have any other closing thoughts maybe on how your community or yourself misunderstood you from like your client base you from personal or um i mean yeah you go first (laughs) um i i don't know that i have anything specific to say except that i just think that um, you know, I really appreciate this was able to be a really thoughtful conversation, I think. And, and one, you know, I appreciated how, you know, at the start of this area, you said that, you know, ask me anything you want. I take no offense to anything, right. you know, because I think that if we could, in, if we could all enter into conversation with a, the implicit assum- assumption that we are not here to be judgmental, that we're here to learn and to understand and to work together collectively to do something better with our experience in life. Um, I think we all would be a lot better off and um, it's unfortunate that we live in a place that is so obsessed with productivity and uh, with achievement in whatever ways that, you know, we normally really think of it, that we don't take the time to be more in community. You so. said after you just applauded our productivity of having a very layered conversation. <laughs> well, that's new one. That's yeah. No, no. In context, because I'm talking about the productivity that exists within my framework of values, which is different than the framework of values, I guess, that I'm speaking to when I'm speaking to the broader discourse. Um, yeah. Do you resonate with what you just said? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, that's my fucking MO. I just wish that people would take a breath and ask questions to understand, not to judge. You know, you don't always need to have an opinion on something. Sometimes we're just here. And if you don't have a very informed, 
you know, educated, elevated concept of something, try not to speak towards it because you're supposed to learn about this subject, not have an opinion on it. Yeah. This is also kind yeah. of to learn, but also based on an opinion. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I said one last comment, yeah, uh, yeah. which is just that, you know, uh, empathy obviously is very important, but I, I am a believer that before we can step into a place of empathy, we have to, uh, we have to be able to embrace generosity because you have to be generous enough to extend empathy to others. And so maybe generosity yeah. is a good starting point, I think, for some of these I conversations. Like that. That's different. I love that. Yeah. I love that. Instead of consent, empathy, instead of empathy, generosity. That's or as a, a, yeah, a generosity is like a prerequisite, prerequisite for empathy, yeah. I guess. I like it. Big difference between empathy and sympathy, too. Oh, for sure. Tons of empathy. Yeah. I have empathy for a lot of people. Sympathy. Yeah. If you want empathy or... What is it? If you want to find, uh, if you need sympathy, it's in the dictionary between shit and suicide. <laughs> <laughs> Drag queen yeah. said that one. So <laughs> like that. Plus, yeah. you know, sympathy assumes so. that you're in a position. That you're like, that oh, you're you. in a position. Yeah, of authority you're the, somehow. You have the power. Or, yeah, you know, exactly. You're giving someone sympathy. Yeah, that's not flattening Eat power at all. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You gave us a lot. Thank you so much for all your insights and your time. This was really interesting. Wish you much success. Thank you. And likewise, I'm very uh, excited to see the future for, for the podcast. Thank Everything. you. Thank you so much. And thank yeah. you, Rachel, for making time. This oh, was thank great. Thank you for having me. For thank sure. you. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Joseph. Shalom. Shalom.